Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Sharon Squassoni. I direct the Proliferation Prevention Program here at CSIS. And I'm delighted to welcome you into this nice, cool <laughs> enclave. I hear that it's really hot outside today. Um, I am very, very pleased to have here with us today Dr. Raja Raman uh, from New Delhi. And uh, before I introduce him, um, I just wanted to make a few administrative notes. So please take your cell phone and put it on vibrate. <laughs> um, we are going to, that's really the only administrative note. The other one is, I think we are totally on the record. Absolutely. Right. Uh, and this is being webcast. Um, so I think we do take questions via email. Is that true, Bobby? Hmm. Well, you can always try. You can try my personal email <laughs> if you want to do that. Uh, we are going to have plenty of time for questions, so um, I urge you to be thinking about that um, as we go along. Um, Dr. Raja Raman, uh, many of you may know him in some of his um, different capacities. He's a theoretical physicist. Um, by training um, and studied under Dr. Hans Bethe at Cornell University many, many years ago. Uh, but he has taught and conducted research at uh, Princeton University, Delhi University, and the Indian Institute of Science, um, and has had uh, longstanding affiliations with Harvard, Stanford, MIT, CERN, and Princeton. Um, some of you here may know him as a founding member and co-chair of the International Panel on Fissile Materials. And when we were talking about, um, you know, what should he come and present on at CSIS, it's really hard because here's an expert who can talk about anything, really, uh, technical issues, policy issues. Uh, and so what we chose to look at was um, in the last year since the BJP came back to power in New Delhi, what's happened, what's shifted, if anything, in uh, the worlds of nuclear weapons and nuclear energy. So, uh, Dr. Raja Raman, I'll give the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon. And so, again, begin by thanking CSIS and uh, Sharon Scosoni for arranging this talk, and Mr. Bobby Kim for all his courtesy in the logistics. Uh, this is my first visit to CSIS, and I'm very happy to be here. I'm overawed by these buildings. Um, I thought it might be useful to give an update of the past year's developments uh, on nuclear India particularly because a new government assumed office about a year ago. Uh, the philosophy of the party that formed the government, the BJP, uh, has been known to be significantly different from that of the earlier Congress government, which uh, ran the country for eight years and then several times before that. Uh, so there was considerable speculation before this government actually came to power as to how this change might affect uh, the country's nuclear policies, both strategic and uh, civilian. Uh, in fact, it may be recalled that the last time the BJP government came to power, within a few months they had exploded the nuclear weapons. So the first nuclear test was done, I mean, apart from the 74 thing, uh, by the BJP government as per its promise soon after it came to power. So the question is, would they do other spectacular things this time or not, and so on. Uh, this is a question whose answer you already know, so I'll just elaborate on the answer. Uh, there are two topics in particular uh, on which developments or absence of, I mean, much of the story concerns the dog did not bark, as Sherlock Holmes says. You know, things that didn't happen are as important as things that did happen. Uh, and they're significant, I'll touch upon them. First is the collection of strategic issues, uh, nuclear posture, such as no first use, and related features of the uh, nuclear doctrine, uh, their relevance to uh, Pakistan's Nasser missile, and 
to Pakistan's proxy warfare through terrorism, this will be analyzed. The current state of minimum deterrence uh, in India will be analyzed. And I'll also talk a little bit about how well deterrence is working, in fact, between India and Pakistan. Then an entirely different subtopic where also things have happened in the past year. I'll talk about nuclear civilian energy and the cooperation with the US and with France and with Russia on building civilian nuclear reactors. So I'll give a little of background of each of these topics and then talk about what happened. Uh, in fact, the, the key thing on the second subtopic is uh, the Nuclear Liability Act in India, which created a lot of problems and it's on its way to being resolved. We don't know how far it will get completely resolved. <clears throat> and then during the Q&A session, uh, Sharon assured me we can have a free for all, anything. So let me talk about the nuclear posture and doctrine. Uh, the, the, late, the last available official st statement of India's nuclear security uh, doctrine comes from a note issued by the Cabinet Committee on Security, which is the highest body in India in discussing security matters. It's a subcommittee of the Cabinet. And it released a new a note it just in the newspapers, as in the public domain, which is viewed as the official statement of our nuclear doctrine. So this remains as our official statement. I won't uh, describe all that is in it because that's old news. Uh, it was based on a draft doctrine that was released in 1999, uh, soon after the test. I think that was a very statesmanlike thing that the government did. The governments generally tend to be secretive, and ours just as much as anybody else's, and to issue a doctrine statement within six months of such a sensitive matter as a nuclear uh, policy uh, was, was, I thought, a good thing. It was released to the public, and people like me who have no, normally no access at all to corridors of anything could read about this in the newspapers and slowly get into uh, to the public debate. So that was done in 99 and remained as a draft level. Four years later, it was made official by this release from the Cabinet Secu Committee on Security. And what I'll talk about here is not the full doctrine, which is complicated, but one element of that was a declaration of no first use. And that's relevant to the past year. Uh, everybody knows what that policy is, but that, that we, India will not use nuclear, be the first to use nuclear weapons against any country. Now, the policy is generally denigrated by many analysts as an empty and pointless thing uh, because it's after all a statement of intent, not a statement of capability, and may not be believed by the adversaries. So what's the point of putting it out? Uh, in fact, my Pakistani colleagues, whom I meet often from time to time on track two meetings, say that they don't put any faith on this no first use doctrine of India. Uh, in the event of a crisis, uh, they would base their strategy on the actual arms movements and deployments and uh, not worry about what the statements earlier to that might be. As hard strategic uh, plan, this of course makes sense. You look at what's going on and not pay much attention to intentions. Nevertheless, I think that it's good that the country put out the no first use statement at that time because it's, it was first of all a sincere statement. Uh, I believe that the country believes this uh, policy. And it is meant to reassure the world community soon after the tests that our intentions are not nuclear aggression or war winning. So it was a good statement at a diplomatic and political level, whatever be its actual operational usefulness. Uh, nevertheless, throughout this period, there has been a body of opinion within India's strategic community, the, the most somewhat more hardline people, who advocate dumping this no first use uh, uh, policy. They feel it wake, weakens our deterrence it encourages adventurism on the part of adversaries. They would rather keep all nuclear options open, as, for instance, I believe is the case in the US and is in the case in Pakistan. Advocates of this viewpoint might have hoped, and many of them explicitly expressed the hope, that the BJP, which is sought to believe in a much more muscular military and foreign policy, would abandon the no first use uh, clause. And on the other side of the debate, moderate elements were concerned about the same thing, that the BJP government would be more hawkish and abandon or modify no first use. And so it's interesting that the prime minister, even before he became prime minister, during the last few weeks of the election campaign, allayed these fears by declaring that he will leave no first use alone, that he will not change it in any way. Uh, that happened approximately a year from uh, now. And so the no first use remains as stated 
in the old doctrine documents. And one would call this, this is a non-development, that's what I meant by the, uh, but as so that nothing is changed, but it's an important non-development, because this is one that was worrying a lot of people. And even now people would like to see it changed. So uh, this is one thing that's happened. The other thing was there were some other changes in the uh, cabinet committee's 2003 doctrine, which were not there in the earlier doctrine. Some things were added. And some of them are relevant to today's uh, uh, situation in South Asia. Now let me mention one of them is the preconditions for nuclear retaliation. It said that nuclear weapons will only be used in retaliation against a nuclear attack on Indian territory and on Indian forces, a phrase that was added which said anywhere. So this phrase then, not there in the old document and added in the new document, and it presumably means then that if the Indians were to go uh, into another country with their forces, and if those are attacked by nuclear weapons, even if that happens in somebody else's soil, India would consider it as an attack on India and can't retaliate. Uh, so this was added in the 2003 document to explicitly deter a nuclear attack on our forces should they enter alien territory. It's not very implausible that in today's situation because after Pakistan developed the Nasser, which is a nuclear-capable battlefield missile, which could be used on invading Indian forces. So this possibility that Indians may be attacked in an alien territory by a nuclear weapon is not so, it's, it's, it's not something which is impossible uh, to imagine. <clears throat> but the threat that India will uh, counterattack with uh, a, a nuclear, massive nuclear attack, I think is an idle threat. Because if there's only a minor nuclear uh, hit on Indian forces within, let's say, Pakistan, killing a few hundred people, a few hundred is not a small number, but in the scale of things one talks about, amongst weapons of grand uh, mass destruction, it is a small number. Killing a few hundred soldiers and destroying some artillery, uh, India will, will deem it wiser to re retaliate with only a conventional attack. It will be silly to have massive nuclear retaliation, even if the other side drops a small nuclear weapon, as long as it does it on another territory and causes far less than uh, damage, which you would call as uh, mass destruction. So there's an argument for removing this clause. In fact, I used to sometimes write saying, remove this clause, because including a threat in your doctrine, knowing fully well that you're not going to go through with it, could lower the credibility. It's a, it's a, it is, of course, speaks well of the country that they won't go through with it. But when you have that in the document uh, and then don't go through with it, it, people would say it could lower the credibility of the doctrine as a whole and reduce subsequent effectiveness of the nuclear deterrent. Uh, uh, but, of course, the government is not going to do that because removing a phrase from a document is a very, very active process and that can be read in a hundred different ways. So I don't think the government is going to change that. Uh, but the la but in, our, in all fairness, the language does not really make it mandatory that we will go and hit them with a nuclear force should they attack us elsewhere, but only that there's the option of doing so. And a distinction between that option and, and the compulsion is something that uh, the adversary may not wish to take a chance on, so to that extent it may serve some purpose. The second change was the addition, uh, this was I think following what the US did, and that is this phrase saying in the event of a biological or nuclear attack, again India will retain the option of retaliating with nuclear weapons. Uh, I think this was in introduced in the US and then the Indians immediately copied it and introduced it theirs. Uh, this again is, is in some sense mostly an idle threat because biological and chemical uh, attacks can come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, somebody can poison some pond somewhere, a few people will die. That's not in the same scale as calling for a massive retaliation. So once again, like the case of uh, the nuclear strike uh, in other territories, this is again something which probably is not in the mass destruction uh, realm at all, but nevertheless it was included because at that time there was a sphere. Uh, and largely because it was done by the U.S. Uh, so these are two additional changes that are operate, which are there, which are still there, which have not been changed by the new government. In fact, the new government really hasn't done anything on the strategic front, which I consider to be a good thing in, in the sense that so much more could have been done that they didn't do. Uh, now, I'll conclude this uh, discussion of the strategic issues by summarizing, in my view, has nuclear deterrence worked 
in India's case. Uh, first, let me take it versus Pakistan. Uh, I think notwithstanding outdated references, which even persist even now of an India-Pakistan arms race, I really don't think India is racing against Pakistan. I mean, at one time, yes, but no longer. Uh, it's true that some Indians get very agitated every time there is news that Pakistan has acquired one thing or the other. Just a couple of years ago, Sipri made a statement that they have 100 weapons and India has only 90 weapons. Everybody got agitated. It's, it, that's all. But luckily, it, these things make very little if, impact on policy. So uh, I, I don't think India is competing at the nuclear, uh, on the, in the nuclear arena with Pakistan at all. Uh, we already have in place an arsenal which is more than sufficient to inflict unacceptable damage. And the nuclear doctrine says that the purpose of our arsenal is one of a minimal deterrent uh, which can cause unacceptable damage. It's not a war winning thing. It's not meant to do more damage than just cause unacceptable uh, damage on the other side. So. Uh, we have an arsenal that's more than enough. I can't go into, won't go into detail because there's not enough time to do this. And therefore, no government, even a remotely responsible one in Pakistan, in my view, would consider a nuclear first strike on India. I don't seriously think they would. I'm not worried that they would. In the same way, Pakistan also has an arsenal to deter India. And no serious analyst, in my view, even in Pakistan, expects us to conduct a nuclear strike on them first. They may worry about many other things, but not this thing. Uh, so I think there's really the deterrent to the extent it's there has worked on both sides. Neither country, I think, seriously expects the other to launch a first strike. Uh, so mutually deterrent uh, arsenal exists on both sides. But I must go on record saying that Pakistan's arsenal has served a different operational purpose. From the outset, uh, Pakistan has argued that their nuclear forces were designed to also deter a conventional attack by India because it's a bigger country with a bigger uh, army and so on. Uh, but the induction of things like the battlefield uh, missile Nasser signals a lowering of that red line, but more than that, the threat of nuclear attacks to cover conventional attacks could apply not just in war, but even in response to an Indian retaliation against terrorist attacks of the kind that's in Mumbai. So if tomorrow there's another terrorist attack and the country, India, were to respond with a conventional hit, would that be considered as something warranting a nuclear response or not? Uh, so the issue of developing a nuclear arsenal to deter a conventional attack in the context of terrorism gets complicated. And there are people who view, who in India, many people have the view that the Pakistan's nuclear arsenal, its main purpose now is a cover for subcontinental terrorist strikes. This is the view. It's not a question of my view. It's the view that people feel. Uh, so this is a problem. In my view, this is the single biggest problem in South Asia. The, the, the only thing that can possibly do spark something there is a terrorist attack on India, not necessarily by Pakistan, but by any, uh, any mischievous element, as they say, who wants to create trouble. All you have to do is to set up a terrorist attack, maybe point some signals towards Pakistan, and you start a whole possibly spiraling uh, sequence of actions. So. Uh, this is as far as Pakistan's concerned. As far as China is concerned, uh, which is really the country about which much of India's strategy and armory now is being built, uh, our deterrence force against China is far from complete uh, for the lack of delivery systems, not lack of warheads, because the number of warheads you need to deter anybody is still small if you believe in minimal deterrence. So. In that context, the developments of the past year, there is the Agni-5, which is a missile which is, whose range is 5,000 kilometers, was tested again a few months ago, and on a mobile uh, launcher. Uh, and if such a thing is placed in the northern border, it certainly can reach Beijing, and it can reach even points higher like Harbin. So uh, finally, India is getting to a stage where there is some kind of a deterrent, but this is very recent. Agni-5, of course, has been under uh, development for some time, but its second or third test has just taken place, and they say in a couple of years it will be inducted into the, into the force. Uh, similarly, the submarine, the nuclear submarine in India, once it's, right now it's still a submarine that's uh, learning its ropes, it's undergoing sea trials and so on, and it doesn't have any missiles placed on it, but if the missiles are placed on it, it poses a threat to China in principle. So finally, India is beginning to uh, have some kind of uh, deterrent against China. Until now, in fact, as of today, it has no deterrent at all. 
and uh, and certainly at the beginning of the uh, around the time of the 98 tests uh, we had nothing at all and i remember after the 98 test going to my first meeting in china expecting that i'll be surrounded by people asking so what happened to the test and so on nobody gave a damn in china and when i asked them aren't you worried they said nah we're not worried so they really were not interested in the indian arsenal uh, most of the time but now i think uh, it's getting to a point where they will take notice uh, of course china has a stock of much many more weapons warheads than much bigger warheads but i think in the if you follow the principle of minimal deterrence this is something that most strategists even in india don't quite understand having a, an arsenal for minimal nuclear deterrence is a very different thing from a war winning arsenal or from a for arsenal for any other reason because in a minimal deterrence you just need enough to deter i mean as as this word goes two weapons bombs dropped on los angeles is all it takes you don't need thousands at all for minimal deterrence all you have to make sure is that those two can get there in the same way same argument applies whether it's india versus pakistan or india versus china and part of the logic of minimal deterrence is that the the size of the adversary's arsenal is not important if they have a thousand elephants you don't have to have a thousand elephants like in the old days here you just need enough to scare the other guy so that is a common factor that doesn't depend on the size and the strength of the adversary's arsenal so in that sense what we have is enough for pakistan what we have is enough for china what china has is enough for the us and so forth so i just wanted to make these comments some of these happened during the past year some of these are in the way of a background so now i'll move on to uh, nuclear energy scene uh, all these are uh, leaving various things open ended we can discuss that uh, later if you like so let me go to the uh, nuclear deal sorry about that Uh, first thing is what uh, the old india us nuclear deal um, just for background let me remind everybody 10 years ago india's nuclear energy capacity was appalling it was only about 4 gigawatts uh, slightly less than that and some of its reactors were running well below capacity for lack of uranium we couldn't buy uranium because there were sanctions uh, meanwhile hopes of continuing with the, the economic growth that was beginning to happen 8 or 9% uh, called for a corresponding growth in energy requirements and therefore uh, for the nuclear share of that energy production it was expected that about 20 gigawatts would be needed by 2020 and 50 gigawatts by 2050 uh, and we had only four at that time in in 60 years of nuclear activity so it was really uh, the requirement was really uh, large and any attempt to reach it was very ambitious so that's why india went in for the nuclear agreement there might have been other reasons which i won't go into the political reasons but purely from the point of view of nuclear energy it was ample reason to seek an agreement with the us and after 3 years of very hard negotiations went on and on and on the newspapers covered it suddenly they had to learn nuclear things uh, finally it led to the lifting of sanctions by the nuclear suppliers group and i don't know how many of you are republicans or how many of you are democrats but i want to go on record that this was made possible because of the bush government they pushed they did the heavy lifting they twisted uh, arms to uh, unbelievable shapes so that the deal will go through and it did so i think indians must acknowledge this fact uh, so in 2008 the deal was complete and after soon thereafter the sanctions were lifted and the major benefits that were expected to accrue to us there were two kinds one is the import of uranium which we were sorely lacking both natural uranium uh, and low enriched uranium for heavy water reactors and the other on this front things are moving well from that time from 2008 slowly agreements are being signed with various countries to import uranium import uranium imported uranium is coming in some sort of a stockpile is being prepared australia australia is one hold out but it's expected that mr modi's attempts to charm them might have worked there too and they might soon agree to uh, give us uranium and existing reactors are therefore back into action apart from new reactors which would require the uranium we are getting uh, the other benefit that was supposed to accrue that's the, the bigger one more difficult one was collaboration on building foreign reactors uh, in india it was clear that the capacity of the indian reactor building community was just not big enough to handle the kind of growth that was needed so it was important it was uh, the growth depended very strongly on requesting other countries to build reactors in return for money 
In this again, there was a very rapid movement in the first instance, soon after the deal. Reactor suppliers from US, Russia, and France were waiting in the wings for the NSG to lift, the sanctions to lift, and, and then there seemed to be enough demand for all three. There was no fight between any of them. We wanted them, the French, we wanted the Americans, we wanted the Russians, all of them to build as many reactors as they, as they wanted. Uh, so initial agreements and MOUs were signed with the following three. Uh, Westinghouse and GE to build their uh, ABWR AP-1000 reactors. Uh, Rosatom from Russia to build eight more of their 1000 megawatt uh, VVER reactors of the kind they, were, they are building in South India now. And Arriva from France to build six of their advanced EPR reactors of 1650 megawatts in Maharashtra. So these agreements, initial agreements and statements of good intent were signed very soon after the deal was done. Things looked very positive at that stage. And then came the Nuclear Liability Act. So I'll say something about the Nuclear Liability Act. Uh, with so much nuclear expansion planned, involving various parties from various countries and so on, it was clear that a, a good, tight nuclear liability law was needed, uh, especially for nuclear uh, accidents. So the Indian Parliament passed uh, what's called the Civil Liability for Nuclear Damage Bill in 2010. Now, the bill had several progressive measures, including a total operator liability of $450 million. They are measured in SDRs for some reason, but it's $450 million. But the important thing about the bill was that this money was to be dispersed within three months of the accident to the victims who don't have to uh, make legal suits and so forth. They just have to show that damage has been done. So it is a very progressive act. Uh, compared to something else that had happened in India, which is what's the next item, the bill, the nuclear civil liability bill, was discussed in the parliament through some co by some coincidence on the 25th anniversary of the Bhopal gas leak tragedy. Most of you may know what that was, uh, a poisonous gas uh, of a, a Union Carbide uh, plant uh, got released and tens of thousands of people died. And, it, and even today, many of them have not recovered. The children are getting problems. So it was a huge tragedy in India. And the public sentiment was that Dove Chemicals, which owned it at that time, did not adequately compensate the victims. So the parliament, in that kind of mood, in the shadow of the 25th anniversary of Bhopal, passed a very strict, comparatively strict, uh, nuclear law which demanded that the operator, which of course in the first, the operator in India means the Indian government. We run all our reactors. So the government was required by the law to pay compensation to the victims. But having done that, they would have right of recourse from the supplier if fault could be shown. There is a proper language for it. I have the entire text somewhere I'll show you. Now, such li supplier li liability is normally makes sense in terms of common sense. You buy a car, you depending on whose fault it is, you can certainly sue Toyota or whoever. Okay? Uh, so it's more the norm than the excep exception in commercial purchases. And in fact, in the Three Mile Island accident in the United States, uh, people sued not only the reactor operator, but the designers and the constructor, the operator design sued the designers. So all this happened even within the US uh, in terms of nuclear liability. However, in the international reactor purchases, uh, supply liability goes against current practice. Um, there's the most recent of these, the Convention on Supplementary Compensation, where the operator is, will be fully liable for uh, damages. So the Indian law, by seeking adding on supply liability, was doing something unconventional uh, and not unexpectedly. All the suppliers from all the three countries, US, France, and Russia, were unhappy with India's supply liability clause. It was also not clear, if, even if they accepted it, who would insure against this. So the price Anderson doesn't exist in India, so it's a different world. And it was not clear which insurance company would give even a policy to cover nuclear liability, whose damages were sort of unknown, and people had all kinds of images of how much it might cost. So as a result of that, as soon as the liability law came in and people understood it to be what it was, progress came to a complete halt in terms of nuclear reactor purchases from any of these three countries. The government worked hard to find a solution acceptable to foreign suppliers, 
including a set of rules. It turns out in governments there are all kinds of ways of enabling around things. So there is a law, but then there is a law has to be interpreted. Then to execute the law, you have a set of rules. So therein you can slip in a few things. And therefore the guidelines for the operation of the liability bill, the government frame formed a set of uh, guidelines where the quantum of penalty was sort of mitigated without violating the, the law. But foreign builders still remain unpersuaded. So this went on for three years. Now, all this was in the previous government, the Manmohan Singh government, which had invested so much in the nuclear deal, people recall the government almost fell and had to, be, had to resurrect itself because of the nuclear deal. So there was a lot they had invested, so they, they continued to try hard to make sure the reactor building part of the deal uh, also uh, fructifies. Finally, a year ago, there was a breakthrough with the Russians, uh, essentially uh, March or something. The plan was, the breakthrough came because of the following plan that Indians, the Indian insurance company, general insurance company, which is a public sector, government-owned company, offered to evaluate each component of the Russian reactors and prescribe an insurance premium. It agreed to insure them. It prescribed a premium that will charge uh, for, to cover compensation that Russia has to pay after an accident. Uh, and the government was also willing to pay the Russians a little bit more money as, for purchase of the reactors to take into account the premium that will be needed to pay this uh, insurance. Um, and as I say, I should mention that this, all this has nothing to do with the BJP or Mr. Modi. This was all done the month before he came to power. And the last few days of the uh, earlier Congress government, uh, their years of effort towards making this happen bore some fruit uh, just around March, April of last year. So the Russians got off the block. And they were already, in any case, building 2,000 megawatt reactors in a place called Kudankulam in South India which had had lots of protests, and the protests, in fact, attracted attention all over. And they were building this even before the international sanctions were lifted in 2008. That's by using what is known in the trade as grandfather clauses, okay? uh, claiming that the agreement to build the reactors in India was made before the sanctions were laid down. Uh, you know, this highly debatable thing, where was that under agreement made? Do two guys just whisper it to each other on the stairwell? Was it written down? But the international community, uh, so in one of these reactors is functioning, the other is expected to commission. The international community just looked the other way on this grandfathering story, they let it happen. This is the mysteries of the international community, I don't understand. In fact, the Chinese are doing the same thing. They are selling reactors uh, near Karachi to Pakistan, using again the grandfathering argument that the deal was struck between them long before the sanctions came in. So some reactors were already being built, including two by the Russians in India. In the new deal, after the sanctions were lifted, two more Russian reactors were, were negotiated to be built, uh, $2.5 billion each. Uh, and the, the bottom line is that the price of the reactors would be such that it will cost customers 6 rupees a unit, which is roughly 10 cents a unit, which is kilowatt hour. Okay. Um, and this price that the Russians would be given for their reactor was taken, was took into account the liability costs. So the premium was included, so the Russians were happy with the price, and, and this has been now negotiated and sealed. On US reactors, there was progress after, only after Mr. Modi. Before that, there was no progress at all. And as you people know, Mr. Modi went on a blitzkrieg of foreign visits after the new government came to power. And he was very well received in all of them, and partly because of his impressive uh, electoral mandate, partly because he had this image of a man who can get things done, and equally importantly, an influential uh, Indian diaspora, particularly in the US. Yeah. And in these visits, Mr. Modi always had the Indian nuclear program, I mean the civilian nuclear program, as one of the items for uh, discussion. Uh, so when he visited the US last fall and had this great event at Madison Square Garden, uh, and also got a friendly reception from the president, President Obama. Uh, and then Mr. Obama subsequently agreed to come as the chief guest at our Republic Day celebrations. So a lot of bonhomie happened in uh, last summer, fall. And as part of all this, the two leaders agreed to actively solve this US, US reactor liability problem. Uh, they uh, applied pressure on their people, excuse me, 
and joint committees were formed with Indian and American representatives to urgently find solutions before Mr. Obama lands in India for the Republic Day. And solutions were found. I mean, both leaders of two governments pressed on it, solutions are found. Uh, and the solution ha had the following highlights. Uh, excuse me. Oops. Okay. One was the insurance pool. Once again, like with the Russians, uh, the liability for the American reactors would be covered by Indian insurance insurers. Half of it would be covered by Indian insurers, and the other half would be covered by the government of India. So some people are upset in India that, look, you're covering their damage liability, but that was what was negotiated. And Mr. Modi has so far been able to withstand whatever pressure there might be against this. The other important part of that agreement with, uh, with the United States was that the US had earlier wanted, as per their own law, periodic inspections of their reactors uh, for non-proliferation purposes. The Indians didn't like that. And the US withdrew that demand on the grounds that IAEA is in any case going to be uh, safeguarding these reactors. So why? So they, they, on their side, they pulled back that demand. Uh, the other concern was that in the liability law, there is a clause which says, like lawyers like this phrase, notwithstanding all the above. So notwithstanding all the above, anybody can sue anybody else in the country in the law of torts. And that this liability act does not exempt the suppliers from normal civil suits allowed by the Constitution of India. So that uh, translated means that some anybody in the streets can say, look, the environment has been ruined by this nuclear reaction, a reactor explosion. Doesn't matter what the operators paid the victims. The country is, you know, has all this uh, expenditure to spend. So there may be a, uh, a lawsuit with no upper limit at all. So this was a matter of concern for the US. It is one particular section of the Liability Act. And the government of India officials seem to have successfully convinced the United States government officials that uh, such law of tort will be used only against, can be used only against the operator who was directly involved and not the supplier. How you convince these things, I don't know the details. The Attorney General of India is supposed to prepare a paper, to have prepared a paper, passed it on to the legal experts on the American side. At the time when Mr. Obama left, both parties seemed happy. This is all I can say. I haven't seen that document, nor could I have really have interpreted it. It really requires a very much more le expert legal uh, qualification than I have. But one must caution that the American reactor problem has not been solved. Uh, first of all, unlike the Russian reactors, uh, it, the American reactors are going to be built by private companies. They have, they have stock, stockholders, they have a bottom line, they have profits. So, even if the two governments are satisfied with the agreement, doesn't mean the builder is satisfied with the agreement. And as far as I know, as of now, both Westinghouse and GE are looking at the fine print. And somebody told me this afternoon, oh yeah, they'll keep looking for another two, three years. So it seems it's not clear how much, you know, the, how problematic that fine print is. So as of now, that hasn't been crossed, even though the two governments have agreed. And there will be a certain amount of political pressure, I'm sure, to make sure this works out. But uh, and. There's an additional complication. Because Toshiba and Hitachi have links with Westinghouse and GE, if I have links, I'm putting it in a diplomatic way, uh, we in India will also need, possibly, a nuclear cooperation agreement with Japan to buy the American reactors. Because Japan's components are there, Japan's ownership, uh, stock ownership is there. So one may need an India-Japan nuclear deal, which we have been seeking, we haven't gotten yet. So there are all these problems still pending with respect to the uh, fruition of the Indo-US cooperation on reactor buying. Okay. And finally, I conclude with some remarks about the French reactors. Uh, again, in the last days of the government, uh, Congress government, the poor thing uh, made a strong push, and France and India agreed to a price on the uh, EPR reactors, uh, where they managed to lower the price from what the Arriva people wanted at the beginning, which is 15 cents per unit, down to six, six cents per unit. This was agreed. And France has also decided to provide India with a loan for the project uh, of building those reactors. All that is all good, but can Riva deliver on the agreement of uh, 10 cents a unit? Uh, their contract to build a similar plant in, in the UK is running into various problems, but even if it all works out successfully, 
there the cost is be 15 cents and there is no supplier liability in UK, it's only in India. So it's not clear how the French can deliver on this. So once again, Mr. Modi came to the rescue, he went to France, and there was much bonhomie, and an agreement was signed as a result between Arriva and an Indian manufacturer of reactor components called Larsen and Tubro. And the deal was that Larsen and Tubro would make reactor components for the French reactor. This uh, satisfied many requirements. One is that the government wanted to push local manufacture of things. And secondly, if uh, this company has been producing components anyway in India for Indian reactors, so it's not that they don't, they have no back uh, experience in this. And if they do in fact produce critical components for the French reactor, it will first of all reduce costs. Costs are much less in India. And secondly, avoid the problem of Arriva sourcing again some components from the Japanese. So these two advantages would accrue if this plan works through. In fact, Ariva is constructing two EPRs in, in China at Tishan and uh, at four billion each, and those seem to be progressing okay. Uh, and the costs there are also lowered because Chinese collaboration has been allowed. So the Chinese are into the technological scene and that brings the prices down. So maybe a similar deal can work in India, but Ariva is having very serious problems, as people know. Uh, already four or five months ago, one read in the New York Times what happened to them. They, their reactors, particularly their construction of EPR reactors, they build all kinds of reactors, but their EPR reactors, the state-of-the-art reactors which they want to build in India, they're building one in Finland. They've been building and building and building for years now. The, there has been a huge delay. It was supposed to be ready 2005. It is now 2015, and it's not ready. Uh, the costs have gone up from 3 billion euros to 8 billion euros. It's still not done. We're still counting. You could say this is because the Finnish are finicky, as they say. That's not the point, because in France, in Flamenville, there's another reactor, same size, same capacity, which the French Arriva is building for France, where again, there has been a delay, it's still not complete, and the price has again gone up from about three, mil, three billion euros to almost eight billion euros. Some problems are therefore arising in building this extremely sophisticated reactor. It's not coming within the projected costs. Uh, and it's also not clear whether Arriva as a company will recover from its financial problems. The latest news I heard was that it's now been given a standard and poor rating of BB minus. It was BB plus already. BB plus meant really don't lend them anything. And BB minus is a couple of steps lower. So the company is having problems. The French government is worried about it. They're taking steps. Uh, people will be fired. All those things will happen. But at the end of it all, will Ariba be in a position to construct reactors in India is not clear yet. So on the French reactor too, one has to keep one's fingers crossed uh, as to what will happen. Thank you. I'm just going to shut this other microphone off. That's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Um, that's a full plate of issues. But done with enough. But you did it within a half hour, so that's terrific. <laughs> uh, well, I, um, for one, have a, a whole list of questions. But while um, you guys are, you and the audience, gathering your questions, I may take the chair's prerogative to ask one or two. Um, right now, even as we speak, the NPT review conference is going on up in New York. And as you know, uh, one of the, the quid pro quos for the U.S.-India deal, for the U.S. unlocking the door to the nuclear suppliers group, um, was to bring India kind of into the fold, sort of to accept norms of non-proliferation. And so um, one of the positive developments, I think, up at the NPT is, and through the PREPCOM, uh, process has been the five nuclear weapon states under the NPT have put together reports. Uh, it's hard to describe these. They're, they're kind of thick. But they're, the basic point was to be a little more transparent about weapons issues, fissile material production, uh, that sort of thing, and, and do a standard report. Um, so <laughs> do you think, uh, here's my question, um, 
as a long wind up for a no, simple no. question. Uh, do you think that this is the, even though obviously India is not going to join the MPT and has certain problems with the MPT, but that kind of reporting is ultimately very important for transparency and accountability. And if we believe eventually we'd like a world without nuclear weapons. So um, is this p perhaps in the cards? Is this even discussed uh, in India? Well, I'm not off the government. Uh, I'm not indulging in any act of treachery in, in mentioning these things, frankly. You know, a year ago, or, I mean, a few years ago, emanating out of this town was the NTI index. Right. on the, you know, various nuclear security and so forth. And uh, India did pretty badly in that. I think it was the second last or third last or something like that. And this year it ended up being the worst, I think. And there was considerable unhappiness back home about that issue. And while that index was being prepared, the government of India was asked several times by NTI to answer the uh, issues that were raised. And the government uh, politely said, no, we don't want to engage in this at all. So this is a typical example. As a result of that, got a bad index in 2012, got a bad index, I mean, rating in 2014. Uh, gradually, the government is uh, realizing the importance of being transparent. Their earlier view was, look, this is between diplomats. We, we tell the Pakistanis, we tell the Americans through proper channels what's going on. We don't have to tell you. I mean, you're just NGO. This has been the operating philosophy of the government. So what they actually do in the way of safety and security is a lot better than what appears from outside. And the fact that the world is changing and that you cannot any longer continue with daddy knows best as a philosophy is something which, will, which is not caught on yet fully. It's happening slowly. The government has, in fact, put out a little pamphlet last year, two years ago, on India's nuclear security and safety, the steps that they have taken. I really think this is because of the pressure that came from these indexes. So it is happening, but it's happening slowly, and it's certainly true that uh, uh, we have not believed in transparency. It was felt that these are all sensitive matters, and as long as we assure other governments, there's no reason for the public to get into it, which is no longer consistent with the world as it is today. So I think it's happening, but happening slowly has not fully happened. Mm -hmm. But it's in the right direction. More and more uh, things are coming out. and. Do you, do, you, do you think that the BJP also? Well, the BJP is that? unlikely to be more transparent than the earlier government. But I think the lack of transparency is not so much a political thing as it's a bureaucratic thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the departments and you know, the officials in these places who are not accustomed to talking about things openly. I don't think uh, the government has told, the political leadership has told uh, the, ministry, the foreign ministry or the nuclear uh, people not to make things transparent. These are considered to be technical matters if the nuclear people thought something could be put in the open, the government wouldn't mind. So I think the change of leadership here wouldn't matter unless top political leaders come and tell Mr. Modi, your country is not being transparent. That would make an impression on him purely in the sense of relations between top political leaders and countries. That may set something going below. But a priori, they don't have a view on this, I wouldn't think, one way or the other. Thank you. I'm going to open the floor. So uh, we have a microphone in the back. We're going to go to Paul Walker first, and then second and third. So please just state your affiliation and Emily this way. <laughs> and then uh, try to make it a question. <laughs> Great, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Sharon, and thanks for the nice presentation. Um, I want to ask you a ba very basic question about what, what's driving, what in your mind is driving India's um, desire for nuclear power. Uh, you know, those of us who I think know a little bit about India realize that it has enormous social economic needs. And given the, uh, the last decade or more of, you know, escalating costs, which you referred to, you know, with regard to the Oklawatu reactor in Finland and now the Flamanville reactor in France, and given the, uh, you know, Japanese recent experience as well, um, it would seem to me that there, this is, a, in some ways, a very foolish, um, uneconomic choice that India is making. Uh, you know, probably any country, let alone one with so much economic needs as India today. So why would India be doing this? Why, haven't, why aren't they more emphasizing either gas, uh, energy, um, or solar or wind or other sustainable 
uh, energy sources rather than nuclear. Well, I think uh, several streams in what you've said which, which made it being answered. One is that there is, in fact, a huge amount of emphasis now on solar energy in India. These things are not really competing with each other because the government is finding funds to, for what it's worth. When during Obama's visit, there's a $20 billion deal on solar energy. Uh, some kind of a promise, of course, at the level of framework agreement. But uh, so there is a great deal of emphasis. The wind capacity in India has always been much more than the nuclear capacity. It's just that the wind, the wind installations work only one seventh or one sixth of the time, wind being what it is. And so the production is less, but the capacity is much, much more. So in a sense, the nuclear has received much more public attention, but the fact is that a fair amount of emphasis, maybe not as much as should be, has gone into solar and wind already in the past. And solar is very much in the, uh, amongst the important things in the new government's policy that, I, that I, one reads it every other day. But what about the nuclear side? Well, the nuclear side has been going on since 1947. It's an old thing, and slowly it's grown. And the sanctions were lifted, so naturally it seemed like a good opportunity to grow in that direction. And I used to be a supporter uh, soon after the, of, of the whole India-US deal for that reason. And I thought the nuclear energy should be encouraged in India in 2008. Prices were not so bad in 2008. The US had just started the renaissance. And in fact, contracts were received from 20 different companies. None of them are making it now because of costs. So the cost is a relatively new development, given the time scale in which these decisions are made. And I'm sure the costs will eventually become a dampener in the Indian project. There's always a turnaround time in this. I don't think we need to abandon it, but certainly need to uh, focus more on other forms of energy. The government is slowly doing it, in my view. Uh, certainly, the French deal, I think, is gone, and the US deal doesn't seem to be working. Uh, for whatever legal reasons, we may be surprised that it works someday. So on its own, uh, costs as well as these problems may lead to a slowing down of the nuclear program. Uh, the other part of the nuclear program, which was very uh, highly favored by the, our agency, was the closed fuel cycle business. Uh, it was thought that we don't have enough uranium in the country, and Mr. Baba, who's the father of our nuclear activities, said, look, you've got thorium, and it's possible to convert thorium into U-233, et cetera, et cetera. So there has been a plan since those days of having fast breeder reactors which would convert thorium into U-233, which would then peel off and reuse and so on. That's the closed fuel cycle. It's, it's a religion in India. Everybody believes in it. But once again, those breeder reactors are not progressing as fast as one thought. So, and also uranium is available in plenty after the deal. So there's an argument for slowly phasing it out. But once an agency has been working for 25 years on a project and slowly overcoming difficulties, you can't tell them to stop. So these are political realities. But in terms of the spirit of what you're saying, I agree. And I think it is going to happen uh, regardless of what anybody thinks. The costs are going to bring uh, the nuclear down is, is my thing. So even though I was a supporter once, I'm no longer a supporter of nuclear energy because of the costs. I'm not that worried about the hazards. I think they have been exaggerated. I, it's my view. But the costs will bring it down, in my, in my view. Question over here. I'm Saira. I'm visiting fellow at Stimson Center. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Rajaraman, for such a wonderful talk. My question is about India's doctrine. Uh, like you mentioned that India is pursuing minimum deterrence. Uh, in October 2014, uh, National Security Advisor Ajit Dobbel, he stated that uh, India is going to shift its uh, posture from credible minimum deterrence to only credible deterrence. So do you think that India is going to increase its nuclear weapons uh, with a high rate, or India is going to pursue open-ended? Uh, and my second question is about this tracking system. Uh, you mentioned that uh, India did not agree to this tracking system, uh, despite of the fact that US insisted on it. Do you think that this uh, is going to have some implications for India's uh, nuclear program, uh, given the fact that India's separation of civilian and nuclear facilities are not physically separated, uh, and not uh, you know nuclear experts are not separated on that? Do you think does it has any implications uh, for India's nuclear program? Thank you. Well, if the country drops the word minimal from the Twitter, I think it will be a very bad thing, is my view. And I don't think there's any serious proposal. In some context, you might have said that. Uh, there are many people who believe in that. But that goes against the whole spirit of the nuclear doctrine. 
there are, of course, lots of people who feel it shouldn't be there. For me, it, uh, I'm, an, I'm against nuclear weapons. So for me, that word minimal is the one word I hang on to and keep on hitting them with the word minimal, minimal. Uh, so I personally think it would be bad. I don't think there's any serious move to do that. You might have mentioned it somewhere uh, to a collection of people who probably wanted to hear that. Uh, so I don't see any other evidence other than that statement that that will happen. It won't happen easily. There will be a lot of uh, resistance to that. Uh, on the separation of facilities, uh, you know, it is already going on. It is, for instance, certain places like Kaiga and uh, uh, Kalpakam are facilities which are now fully military. So even though power comes out of it, that power goes into the breeder. It's one of the eight protected. So I think the separation is going on. The separation of the human beings hasn't taken place in some sense. Same person is the chief of both. That happens in, in, in many places. But the process of separation of the physical facilities is happening so that inspections and safeguarding and so on can be done conveniently at one place without intruding into a place where it shouldn't go. That process is beginning to as more or less happen now. What has happened is a cluster of reactors in certain places have been called military, and clusters have been called civilian, and they are not in the same region at all. So that's been happening. And we have a question up here, Mike. Uh, Michael Lowenthal with the National Academy of Sciences. You've talked about the nuclear doctrine, and I wondered if you could say anything about how um, any change in the nuclear doctrine might be translated into actions or changes within the nuclear weapons enterprise itself, the production and so forth. Uh, there have been changes in the new developments in enrichment and things like that in, in India that um, have people asking questions, and it's not clear how it links up to the doctrine? Well, uh, the doctrine, the, the important thing is, of course, whether it's minimal and so on. If it is minimal, then there is also a question of how much you think is needed for minimal. That remains as an item of debate. Uh, as of now, the reactors that have been designated to produce weapon-grade plutonium are continuing to do so, but there isn't too much of it. There's only one reactor left, that's the Dhruva. So, uh, any change in policy right now is not going to make much of a difference. The real difference will come when the breeder reactor is completed and you see what happens to the plutonium that is siphoned off that. That is real yummy <laughs> weapon plutonium which comes out of a breeder reactor. So with the, the can claim... We, yeah. Can we quote you on that? No, no, no. Really oh, yummy? sure. Yeah, is that it, a technical? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not technical. Term. As from tomorrow, it may be, become one. But, uh, yeah, because it's essentially a dry-cleaning instrument, the breeder reactor. You feed in bad plutonium, you get out weapon-grade plutonium out of it. But the government claims that they're using this plutonium only for feeding further breeders to generate more power. So at the time when the breeders have worked for five years and the rods have been taken out, reprocess what it does with that material will determine whether there's going to be any significant increase in the weapon count or not. Until then, the Dhruva is going to go on. Dhruva can make at most three, four weapon warheads a year worth of material. So that's not a very rapid growth at, at this time. So at the moment, I think any changes of policy is not going to significantly affect the warhead production. It might affect the delivery system production. That those things may happen. So the launching of the submarine, the launching of the Agni-5. They are examples uh, not of any change in doctrine, because the doctrine always said there would be a triad of uh, you know, sources from which these can be sent up. So there is no change of doctrine, but there is progress in implementing those aspects of the doctrine, which may very well be pursued quite vigorously by the current government, with, with its ideology being what it is. Uh, I don't know if I answered any. We have a question back here, Jeff Smith. Sorry. <laughs> no, you, you, I'm sorry. You you can you can then no no Jeff first and then Jeff had his hand up first. No, oh. sorry. Sorry. Who do you want to go? <laughs> I'm sorry. The gentleman behind you first, hey. and then and you can follow up. Just pass the microphone. We'll Hi, take two. It's, it's Jeff Smith at the Center yeah. for Public Integrity. Um, could you say something more about the an expansion of enrichment capacity at Mysore and Chalakir, the two new facilities that are under construction or have been? It, Mysore has been operating for a bit and it's being still being constructed. The, uh, Mr. Lowenthal's question um, asked you about the impact of 
enhanced uh, capacity on um, perhaps your weapons development and the strategy that underlies the use, the potential use of those weapons. And you, you answered about plutonium, but the expansion that's underway now has to do with enrichment. And uh, as you know, uh, many outside observers feel that the expansion exceeds what's necessary to fuel the reactors on the submarines. So they see an excess there, and they're wondering what that excess is for. I'm interested in your opinion about what it's for. Let me ask Jalal. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, it's true that more expansion, there is expansion going on in enrichment facilities. Uh, the government statement is that we are going to build a whole fleet of these submarines. The second one is already, the hull has been done, and the third one is already beginning. So it's hard to say with any surety that these are not going to be used for that, uh, the, the new enrichment facilities. I don't know what is the quantitative basis of worrying about that yet. I'm sure people have said so. Uh, I personally would think that there is no plan to build weapons using uranium, uh, HEU. One reason might be if the government wanted to have H-bombs, fusion bombs, for which you do need HEU in, in various intermediary uh, capacities. But I don't think the government has any plans to uh, revive building stronger weapons than the good old 20 kiloton, 50 kiloton fissile weapons, fission weapons we have. Uh, once again, this is connected to minimum deterrence. Certainly, you want to make a bigger bang for the buck, you would want to build the H-bomb, and there was also the feeling that the earlier one fizzled out. There was much talk about that. But the government hasn't picked up that fizzle and saying, well, we must therefore go back and te test again. That's a related issue. If you, that fizzled out, then if you want to build bombs using HEU and so on, you'll have to test again. Computer tests may not be good enough. And testing is something I'm quite sure the Indians don't want to do. Not only will you use the, lose the NSG and all the benefits that come from it, uh, you'll simply bring a lot of opprobrium on yourself. Uh, so uh, even though people don't accept this minimal deterrence, regardless of what's written on paper, by and large, there's no great demand to increase the arsenal a whole lot. Even if people worry that Pakistan has got some more weapons, that just dies out after a few days. Uh, some of us get on TV and go, and that's all that happens. So I really don't think there's any, seri this is my reading, of course, you know, much of this one, one only has to go by one's nose, one doesn't really know what's deep inside in the minds of the government. From whatever I know, I don't think there is any real move to enlarge the arsenal a great deal in India. There is a move to enlarge the delivery vehicles, that I know, but the arsenal, the number of warheads, I don't think there is. So if they are building more HEU, my own judgment would be that they are just building it as long as they can, as fast as they can. You never know how much you will know need for which submarine, and these are all long-term projects. You don't know when the submarine will be ready. So I think those are probably not meant for weapons, would be my reading, sir. Uh, okay. Right here, and then Walt, you're after that. Thank you. Uh, ben Lamont with the German Marshall Fund. Um, sir, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on the politics of possibly reforming the Liability Act. Mm -hmm. um, the nuclear scientific community was notably uh, notable for its opposition to the, the agreement in the first place. Are they active at all about the Liability Act? And is there any possibility of a wholesale um, revision of the act? Or are these side deals uh, going to be the future? And, and if so, can they sort of deliver uh, the capacity that, that people are hoping for in terms of the number of reactors, et cetera? Well, as far as the repeal of the, or the any change in the law, I, I think that's politically simply not possible. Uh, the government exert, I mean, expended a great deal of its goodwill and its energies in getting the nuclear deal through uh, the NSG clearance. After that, when these liability laws in came, uh, they, there just wasn't enough steam left to overcome the very strong opposition that was there against the suppliers. So I think the chance of uh, the government being able to and the present government was very much in the opposition and fought for the liability law at that time. So I think the liability law is going to stay. People will just try to find legal ways around it to the extent it is possible. I think, I think that, that is what is likely to go on. And your other part of the, was that? Will, will those side deals be enough to uh, sort of how much capacity will they be able to deliver? Uh, 
in terms of uh, 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 reactor capacity? Well, if these three things work, even then I don't think we're going to hit 50 gigawatts by 2050. No way. But let's, we can just add the, each of these countries is supposed to build roughly 8,000 megawatts. Uh, and that is going to take a long time. So I think even in the next 20 years, if 8 times 3, 24 gigawatts come, that's the maximum one can expect. I think it will be much less than that, I'm afraid. Uh, so the notion of having 60, 60 gigawatts, I think, is not realistic. And I think the sooner we stop uh, talking about those numbers, the government, it, the better it would be. Thank you very much. My name is Walt Slocum. Uh, I'm with the Atlantic Council, and I used to be in the Defense Department. Thank you very much for a very interesting, and at least for one who was not a specialist, very forthcoming and candid presentation. I wanted to ask a question about the no first use issue. If I understood you correctly, uh, although Pakistan maintains formally a no first use policy, there is concern in India that they, in fact, go beyond simply the inherent capability, which you mentioned, but that they have actually done things uh, which indicate that they regard their nuclear arsenal as a part of conventional deterrence. And my question is, what are the elements beyond the Nasser missile uh, that make one concerned on this point? And for the longer term, is there any prospect of a discussion or an agreement in which both sides would uh, agree to refrain from certain actions that increase the concern about, I guess better to put it another way around, to do things or to refrain from actions that would increase the inherent credibility of the respective no first use pledges. Uh, as far as my understanding is concerned, sir, I believe that Pakistan does not have a no first use policy. It is explicitly said that we don't believe in that because our concerns are different, uh, the things that worry us are different, and in particular because the nuclear uh, forces in Pakistan are developed as a counter to the conventional Indian nuclear forces. So uh, the first part of what you raised, I have to ask you again in the sense, I don't think Pakistan has ever declared a no first use policy. And to the extent that statements have emerged, uh, from various people, there's no official doctrine documented in Pakistan. Statements always have said, no, we do not believe in no first use. Uh, so that is where that remains. On the other fronts, uh, it's hard. At the moment, they, they do have various kinds of agreements. They notify each other's missile launches. They, they notify each other's the locations of the reactors so that nothing is bombed there. Uh, at that level, fair, fair amount of threat reduction and uh, 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 CMBs are uh, taking place, confidence building measures. But uh, in stronger, on, on stronger uh, items, it's not happening. For instance, one of the things in track two and so on I, I try to push is that in, in as much as our weapons are demated and de-alerted, in as much as the uh, Chinese weapons are supposed to be demated, and the Pakistani weapons are also demated as of now, why don't the three countries get together and announce that our weapons are demated? and that we are in a state of de-alert. Uh, country is not willing to do that. I, I even try to tell the Indians, why don't we just volunt you know, uh, voluntarily just announce unilaterally that our weapons are demated. Countries don't want to make that commitment. There is no compulsion. There is no pressure either from the outside world or from within the domestic polity, which doesn't care about these issues at all, to do that. And governments normally would not do something like that unless there is a, there is a push. So there is basically no pressure. Uh, from anybody else that, uh, that they should do things to mitigate the dangers. Uh, by and large, I would consider both countries to be fairly responsible possessors of nuclear weapons. Uh, unlike the Wall Street Journal article in 2007 and so on, I have complete faith that our boys can keep it as well as anybody else. And there is every reason to believe we had no accidents or anything. Uh, but beyond that, the, any active measure to actually come to agreements and announcements, neither government seems to be willing. That includes China. I've had trilateral meetings with them. They all seem to say, yes, we do it, uh, but we don't want to particularly get into a formal announcement uh, that we do these things. Uh, if, I, if I may follow 
up on that. Um, th this question of Pakistani tactical nuclear weapons um, has been, I mean, I hope it's being followed in, in, in if there are India-Pakistan track to uh, dialogues now. I have heard that even um, in um, other track two dialogues, we've, we've tried to, um, US and Russian uh, track two experts have tried to point out the, um, shall we say, deleterious effects of <laughs> tactical nuclear weapons in the NATO context. Um, I, when I look at the, the, the security environment right now, I see a lot of troubling things happening in Pakistan. I see it, that being one of them. And then India is perennially focused on China. At what point um, can you, is there a possibility of de-linking? Because that's a... Uh, de-linking, which in which? No, de-linking. Uh. Well, the, the fact that as, as India tries to establish its uh, credibility vis-a-vis -vis China, right. Pakistan continually kind of ratchets up a little bit. And this question of, to, to the detriment of Indian Pakistani relations, and the, this question of this, the language anywhere, I would think almost that's a positive thing because Pakistanis are seriously thinking about, you know, the use of tactical nuclear weapons on their own soil yes. <laughs> against the Indians, and they think the Indians won't retaliate. So, but, so, so that deterrence is, you know, a good thing and a bad thing. Right, You're, I would hate to see the two countries walk down that path that the U.S. and Russians did for so many years with absolutely at such great expense. And there is also rumors that the Indians are building now uh, weapons which could be sort of battlefield usable. Uh, there's no confirmation that they are nuclear capable or not, but uh, cruise missiles are being built, and this question: Can they carry nuclear or not? Many things can be nuclearized later, even if it's not. So this trend is there, and it's a very bad trend. Uh, but uh, uh, what does I say? Um, sorry, was there something more that uh, that you had raised? So, so one of the questions is: What can you know? What kinds of confidence-building measures? You know, is it dialogue? Is it technical measures? I think it's not. Probably to me, it's not just statements about demating. Mm. It, it probably has to go a little further than that. So I wondered if you had any well, there is, yeah, suggestions. One, well, one particular new problem has come with the submarines. With the submarines, it's harder to be in a state of de-alert than with other forms of missiles. So any attempt on India's part to talk to Pakistan saying, let's de-alert, after the coming of the submarine, immediately the issue will come up, what about your submarines? That is, that is one thing. The other thing is also the coming up of these mobile launchers. Uh, now that both countries are learning to use launchers that can move around in order to ensure survivability of the weapons, that lowers your ability to do things in the last minute. The launchers have to be, uh, more or less have to carry everything with them. You can't keep the weapon somewhere else and bring it over. And So things in terms of technological developments are actually going backwards in this, on this area of de-alerting and keeping things non-ready. It uh, doesn't directly answer your question, but it's a related situation, related development. So the technology is pushing it in a different direction, unfortunately. Uh, and so when mobile line, Agni 5, for instance, has is, is out of a cistern, you know, it's the, it's the mobile uh, launcher. And once you do that, uh, you have to put the weapon in it. You can't uh, bring it from somewhere else. And so I'm afraid that that family of confidence building measures is going backwards rather than forwards. Um. So, so if I may, do we have other questions? Yeah. I have one more question for you. Sure. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, Zahid Jamil, uh, Center for Strategic and Policy Analysis. Uh, thank you for the very illuminating uh, uh, this, uh, presentation. It was really helpful. Uh, I, I had two questions. One, uh, you're, you're right that there is no doctrine on no first use as far as Pakistan, but the president had made a statement to the Hindu, in fact, to the, to the Indian press, which has been a matter of controversy. So it's never been sort of uh, 
reconciled as to what it, but the, but the president in Pakistan had made a statement. Uh, the military may have a different view. We don't know. We'll see. Um, just to set the record straight on that. One. Uh, second, on the question, I, I know we're talking about the nuclear aspects, but, and you said that there would, you know, India doesn't need to have a sort of arms race anymore as far as nuclear is concerned with Pakistan. Uh, can, can I get your thoughts on the uh, possibility of an anti-ballistic missile sort of uh, race that may take place and what that would do to the number of uh, uh, warheads or deployed, uh, you know, deployment capabilities? Thank you. Yes, that, the last thing is a very, very important point. Uh, I had, had forgotten not included it because of time restrictions. Uh, anti-ballistic missile development will completely uh, ruin all my arguments about minimal deterrence and so on and so forth. Because if the minimal deterrence you have is stopped by the other side, you just have to get more weapons. So what would have been a more or less stable uh, ending of the arms race fairly soon can be ruined by successful development of uh, missile defense. Uh, fortunately, I think the missile defense in India is still in its infancy. And it will take a long time before any reasonable defense is possible. Also, these are counter-value weapons, I mean, which is a nice way of saying that the plan is to bomb the people, not the not the silos, so to speak. And in counter values, you know, as long as even one city is open, you're vulnerable. And anti-ballistic missile development, even if it goes much faster in India and so on, may at most protect some apex leadership, uh, some central part of New Delhi or something, but it's not going to be protect, can't protect the 200 major cities of India. Uh, so I think in some sense, it will not seriously affect the Pakistani deterrence capability even if India successfully builds, which itself is far away. So in that sense, anti-missile missiles, you know, if a country simply has anti-ballistic missiles to protect its apex leadership or its main arsenal or things like that, the other country won't mind as long as the, the aim of the nuclear weapons is, uh, is against, is, is intended to be used on civilian populations and not on. So that being the case, fortunately, the anti-ballistic missiles will not do as much damage as they could otherwise otherwise do. But it is still a, a, a sort of dangerous development, uh, anti-ballistic missiles. Other questions up front? Oh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Milton Honig. Um, you know, a few years ago, a while back, there was um, reports of concern over exchange, nuclear exchange over Kashmir. What is the, is there anything current going on in Kashmir that would raise the heat to that level? I don't think so. I don't think there would, I don't think there was ever a situation where inside India and Pakistan, people felt there would be nuclear exchange over Kashmir, even when the Kargil thing happened. Uh, I think, I was in the U.S. and that was considered the most dangerous place on earth. I'd call my wife saying, how is it? She said, it's fine, nothing's going on here. So I think that, uh, I think the both countries in this sense have been quite responsible that the threshold for their going nuclear has been kept very high and they don't lightly consider doing it. Political statements are a different matter. Some vigorous leader may come and say, we'll bomb the hell out of the other country and so on. That's just words. In serious things, I don't think there was ever a situation even when the two armies were confronting each other nose to nose, uh, no nuclear thing was ever contemplated. So Kashmir is the kind of dispute where unless, uh, I, I don't think it will lead to nuclear conflict. What is more likely is a Kashmir-like event happening, the heartland of India. That could set things going in the sequence that I said led to conventional thing. A direct nuclear response to anything, any act of terrorism in Kashmir or anywhere else is totally un unlikely. I don't know if that does answers your question or not. Other questions? Um, yeah. Um, Michael Lowenthal again. Um, you described the the deterrence strategy in very much the same way that I've seen it described elsewhere, which is uh, sort of multiple bilateral deterrent uh, relationships. Do, do you or do other people in India think about it in terms of a multilateral dynamic that may be a little unstable in other ways that you wouldn't capture in a, in a multi, multi bilateral approach? Uh, multi bilateral as distinct from just bilateral? I mean, uh, well, can you, can you explain the terminology? So, 
I mean, what we're most accustomed to in the United States is a bilateral right. uh, uh, stability relationship with the right. Soviet Union and then Russia. Um, clearly, India has two different potential adversaries on its borders that it worries about deeply. Um, so it's sort of multiple bilateral sure. cases. Yeah, it's multiple three-way because there is also links between yeah, exactly, and that's, why, that's yeah. what I'm talking about. Is there yeah. more sophisticated thinking about the stability of the trilateral relationship? Yeah, I don't, good question, but I think the only stability there would be a set of three bilaterals, so to speak, that each country really feels no need to be aggressive on the other two for whatever reasons on the nuclear front. Uh, I don't think the fact of it being, a, there's no three-body force there, I think it's only pairwise two-body things is my view. That's what's been holding so far. And the dynamics of each pair is going to be independent of, uh, well, except for the Pakistan-China dynamics will affect the India-Pakistan-India-China relationship. But even then, uh, it could, one thing that could happen is that if there is too much concern expressed, let's say, by India about a China-Pakistan nexus, so to speak, as to use that word, it may well be that the Indians may seek an agreement from China saying, look, you can't do this kind of thing. So they may force, there may be an attempt to get an agreement out of all three countries saying, all right, we won't do this, and you don't do that, and you don't do that. That may happen. A road is being built across uh, uh, the Pakistani-occupied Kashmir, and that is the kind of thing, if it, if it turns out that it can land planes on it and so on, people may get sufficiently agitated in India to seek a trilateral solution. As the thought never occurred to me until you asked the question, so I'm talking from the top of my head. Uh, that is the kind of thing that could start such a process. Uh, where one of the three says there's only way this can settle down, only way our bilateral anxieties can be settled is through a trilateral agreement. Then it might happen, but somebody has to f feel that way. Uh, Pakistan clearly doesn't feel that way, and China doesn't feel that way, that the trilateral is an issue. Indians are the only ones sort of stuck in the fulcrum of that thing. So Indians may someday seek such a thing in that case. It could. We have time for one more question up front here. Uh, hi, uh, Yashwant Raj from Hindustan Times, and there's not a question. Uh, it was pa President Zardari who said that Pakistan has a no first use policy, uh, and he said that at one of our summits, uh, you know, we have, a, have an annual summit, and he said this in response to a question, uh, which didn't, which was clearly not a stated position, he just, he was winging it because next morning, the army was all over him, and there were denials of all kinds coming out. Not denials, but clarifications came out saying the president was kind of winging it. So just thought I would clarify that bit. Thanks. Yeah, I think the gentleman there was. I don't, I forget the year uh, which he said this, but he said this to Hindustan Times. Mm. Yeah. That's thank right. you. No, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Any final comments? No. Well, thank you. please. Other than to thank you. Uh, well, no, no, no. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Bobby and Emily for your support and our IT staff, and please join me in thanking our guest for a fantastic time. Thank you. Thank you.